Hello, um, this event is, as you know, called Quarantines, Vaccines and Museums. And tonight we're just going to explore the ways in which uh, museums and places that care for our heritage have um, approached the situation that we're living in. Nobody really wants to live through hugely historical events, um, but we are at the moment. And because of that, it's brought a whole host of challenges and um, interesting opportunities for museums. So I'm thrilled to be hosting this event with two amazing local museums. We've got Dr. Jenna's house in the house um, and we've also got E Museum as well. Um, both of these places were established in the 1980s in terms of being open to the public. Um, so we're going to, I'm going to be chatting to the two, two key people at each location tonight um, and we'll be doing this for around 40 minutes but after that 40 minutes there'll be an opportunity to ask questions as well so if you want to do that um, please use the Q&A box as opposed to the chat the Q&A box at the bottom to um, ask your questions and I'll go through some of them at the end and, and put them to our speakers and um, just a, another tiny bit of um, housekeeping if you're on social media there's a hashtag called Eam, hashtag Eam Jenna now um, and if you want to tweet about the event, that would be fantastic. Um, finally, I, I think our two speakers will be a bit too humble to ask for this, but they are accepting donations. Um, and you can do that through the e-museum website and it will be split in half between the two places. One last thing before we get started, if you need to use live captions, you can. That's at the bottom of the screen. Right, um, that's enough from me. Um, we will get started now. So our two speakers, um, as I've said, are from these two locations. We have Owen Gower, who's the museum manager at Dr. Jenner's house, um, a place that's been open to the public since 1985. And we also have Owen Roberts, who's been the curator at E-Museum um, for the past year or so, so throughout the pandemic, and that has been open since 1989. So Owen R and Owen G, hello. How are you doing? Hello. Hi, very well, thank you. Yeah, fine, thanks. Yeah, great. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. I, w I wonder if, first of all, we could um, have a little bit of background at your two, well, your respective museums. So, um, Owen R, if we start with you first, could you tell me a bit about E Museum and its background? Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, well, it was founded in 1989, as you said, uh, and moved to the current premises in 1994. But before I go into all that, I'll just explain a little bit about you know where we are. We're based in the village of Eam in Derbyshire in the Peak District and it's most famous for its experience of plague in 1665-1666. It's quite a well-known story uh, but just to recap briefly, um, outbreak of plague in London in 1665 uh, comes to Eam in September 1665 in an infected package of Taylor's materials. The plague spread uh, over the next couple of months. Nearly 30 people had died by the end of the October. Slowed down over the winter months, uh, but flared up again in the spring of 1666. By June, uh, the rates were so high, to use a phrase we're all familiar with, um, a quarantine was introduced in the village. Nobody was to leave or to enter in order to stop the plague from spreading in the wider area. Arrangements were made for supplies to be left on the parish boundaries at agreed points that you can still see today. And the quarantine lasted for about five months. It was successful in some respects in that it did prevent the spread of the disease, but it came at a very high cost. Uh, about 260 people from a population of around 700, 800. Um, so about a third of the village uh, died in the process. It's inspired lots of novels, plays, poems, documentaries, uh, children's books, and recently a, a weekly cartoon. So at the museum, we tell the story of that experience, as well as some other aspects of Eames history. And um, we're a small museum, we're an independent museum with a very small staff team, but lots of brilliant volunteers. And we know, but although we're small, we get loads of visitors. <laughs> Um, under normal circumstances. So that's a little bit of an overview of who we are, what we do. 
Thank you. Thank you. And OMG, I hope you don't, I, we, we joked actually when we were planning this event that it's kind of like the Spice Girls, me using your, the first initial of your surnames, but I'm afraid we're going to have to do this tonight. OMG, um, could you tell me about um, Dr. Jenner's house, please? Of course. And, and thank you to, to ONR for the suggestion that we combine this event. And thanks very much, Rebecca, for, for hosting this event. It's um, really great to, to be here and to, to have so many people to tuning in. Well, I just see one person's just dropped off the list when I started speaking. So sorry about that. Um, I'm Owen Gower. I'm the museum manager at Dr. Jenner's House. Dr. Jenner's House really, I mean, we call it the birthplace of vaccination, the home of vaccination, perhaps. It's the adult home, the lifetime home of Edward Jenner, who's most famous now as the pioneer of vaccination. So, I mean, there's a long story of Edward Jenner, so many different discoveries that he made prior to, to the big one, but the one that he's most famous for and best known for now is that in 1796, he carried out what we consider to be the, uh, I suppose, the world's first clinical trials, you might call it, into the use of one disease cowpox to protect against another disease smallpox and in doing so Jenna really set the scene for so much of, of what we see today in terms of the subsequent history of vaccine development. Vaccination now saves between two and three million lives each and every year and we celebrate that from the place where it all started and here in, in Berkeley in the garden of Jenna's house we have the Temple of Vaccinia which is the it's a rustic thatched hut, a, a garden site summer house that Edward Jenner uh, repurposed as the world's first vaccination clinic and it was there that he really lived out his values of offering vaccination free of charge to those who needed it most. Every Sunday after church he would open up his garden, invite people to come in and to receive vaccination uh, and so the Temple of Vaccinia and Jenner's house together have been open to the public since 1985 and, and really are a, a special place in the heart of, of so many people both here in Berkeley where we're really proud of him but around the world where so many people look to look to this as being a, a place of hope a place where something really quite amazing happened and started. Apologies I wasn't ready then taking myself off mute but it's they're both amazing locations and they tell such unique um, and fascinating histories. I just wonder with with all the public interest that's been triggered um, during this pandemic amongst so many other things and the desire to make parallels between what's happening now and what's happened in the past. What kind of responsibility does this place on museums? Owen R if I start with you. Well I think the biggest responsibility it, it places is to respond to that interest to engage with it, to make the story as accessible as possible to as many people as possible. And that's by, you know, taking part in that media interest, giving interviews, appearing in documentaries, running online talks like we are now. So we sort of have a responsibility to meet people where they are. If they've got an interest, find the point where their imagination has been captured um, for some it's about telling the individual stories of people in Eme at the time of the plague, people like Elizabeth Hancock burying her husband and all her children. For other people, it's about the vinegar that coins were left in, in return for the supplies. Uh, for others, it's about the idea of the community doing this great thing together uh, to sort of save other people. Um, for others, it's about the horror of so many deaths in one place in a short period of time. So it's all those, uh, I think it's all that it's our responsibilities to sort of take that interest and to engage with it and to, and to I think an important responsibility is to be reliable, <laughs> to give some detail behind those headlines and to point out the complexities, to put the story in context, to sort of point out what is unusual or what, what actually in context was not unusual um, and also to help, and perhaps we can talk a bit about this later, but it's also to help identify what in the story is from the novels and, the, and their creative responses and, the, and also what's in the sort of historic record. But yeah, perhaps we can talk about that a bit later, but I think they're some of the responsibilities that spring to mind. So quite quite a lot, really. Um, yeah. Owen, um, gee, do you have anything to add to that? Because obviously, with 
with Dr. Jenna, we're, you know, that feels like a kind of eureka moment, like, oh, you know, finally, there's a vaccine, we can cure smallpox. And we're going through a similar moment, I suppose. Um, but, you know, what challenges do you have with these parallels that are being made? Absolutely. And of course, I, I'd echo everything that, that other Owen has said. And, and, and yeah, it, it really is. It's an opportunity for us to share our collections, to share our stories in, in, a, in a way that we haven't before, in a context that we haven't before. And really in the past year, we've seen a, a glimpse, albeit temporary, of a world without the vaccine that we most want. And, and that really does hark back to living in, in, in a world before, before the vaccination against smallpox, before Edward Jenner. Uh, but I, perhaps I'm being a bit contrary maybe, I think as well there is a limit to the relevances and a limit to, um, to what we can talk about and what we can connect with the past. And I think that our responsibility as a museum is not just to know what to share and how to share it, but also to know what not to share, to know when to stop, to know when something isn't actually um, a, a useful comparison. And, and I think part of that is, is you know, our responsibility is to, is to be informed. We take a lot of um, pride, I suppose, in, in trying our very best to keep up to date with what's going on in the in the real world, in the current world, because we know vaccination is, is such a big topic, but it's also a really complex topic. Vaccine hesitancy is a really complex topic that we can't break down into simple, you're either for vaccine or against vaccine. Uh, and rumours are dangerous. We see that in, in, in the world of, of vaccination, you know, a, a rumour can start and then can actually just derail a whole country's vaccination program for for months if not years so so we're, we're really quite cautious um uh, and i think yeah i mean to, to give a couple of couple of examples perhaps um a, a very trivial example is that a couple of weeks ago we were asked and approached for information about the use of artwork in promoting vaccination throughout history you know, we consider ourselves to be a, a museum of vaccination, but actually that is a really specific topic. And I haven't got a clue about the history of artwork. I'll admit that I, I don't, it's not a subject that I know much about, but the, the kind of the, the, the instinct, the public relations instinct in me says, well, let's, let's try and jump in on that. It's an opportunity to contribute to a national newspaper, but actually, the other part of me and um, what I did in the end was was saying well there's there must be someone who knows more and using that to signpost to another curator another collection that that might know significantly more about that even though it, it would ultimately mean that that we would lose out on the opportunity of, of publicity and that's a that's a trivial example I mean another another example and and this wasn't a, a museum actually but here in the UK um, and I'll, I'll say that because I know that um, there are people joining from around the world uh, at the end of our, our first in, in a series of, of lockdowns in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, one city was left in limbo for, for months. I, I think probably to some extent they're still in limbo and that's the city of Leicester. Leicester has got a really interesting history in terms of public health and one of the things that people were very keen to jump on, commentators were very keen to jump on at the time, was that Leicester was the hotbed of the anti-vaccination movement in 19th century England. Leicester had its own method for dealing with smallpox. It had a very targeted vaccination, quarantine, really an integrated public health system that they called the Leicester method. Uh, suddenly I was seeing lots of, lots of comments about, well, this is just part of the history of exceptionalism, health exceptionalism in Leicester. Uh, and that really troubled me because the issues that were in play this time round were issues of systemic inequality. They were issues of the fact that people from black and minority ethnic backgrounds are more likely to suffer severe consequences of COVID, more likely to have COVID, that people from deprived backgrounds, 42% of children in Leicester are living in poverty. To say that the continuation of lockdown, the impact of COVID in Leicester was just as a result of Leicester just always going their own way is, is to really brush those, those significant issues 
under the carpet. Uh, and I think we've got a responsibility to, to call that out and also to say, yeah, no, not everything has a direct relevance in history and not everything is a, is a bandwagon to jump on. And, and certainly I'd say that's, that's not directed at any, any museums in particular. And certainly, as I say, that Leicester example was not a museum doing it. But, you know, it, we, we do have to be very careful with what we say because what we talk about in the past can have real world consequences. That's so interesting, the, the, the nuance, and it leads me on quite nicely actually to the, the next question I wanted to ask. So I guess we're all guilty of wanting our history, you know, our big histories simplified as much as possible. If we're in a rush, you know, we're all guilty of that. And um, museums certainly have established histories that they they need to tell. Um, they're part of their USP. Uh, so I just wonder what challenges you have individually as, as um, museums in trying to frame these well-known histories with global and wider um, context. So Owen R, if I start with you with that question. Well, I, I suppose, I think one of the challenges is, I was really reminded when we were just talking uh, about that it's not always easy to map parallels from the past to the present, even though we like to do that. And I was thinking about uh, Margaret Atwood, who, and I think she was quoting somebody else, but she said that uh, history doesn't repeat itself but it does rhyme. And I think the responsibility, going back to the first question, is kind of to bring out that rhyme. So it's not as simple as saying, look, history's repeating itself, but it's saying, hear how it rhymes, um, which isn't quite the same thing at all. Um, but I think one of the, I suppose the, the challenges there in that is, is how you balance the public interest with um like for example when i mentioned earlier about for a lot of people it's the individual stories it's, it's like people like elizabeth hancock burying six children for example it's that that it, people balancing a focus on the individual um against the bigger picture and not at all diminishing the terrible tragedy of individuals but in the focus on the individual not to think about the whole community and that sort of wider impact. And I think there's also a danger of sentiment. Like there's a really popular image of, I keep going on about Elizabeth Hancock, but there's a really popular image of her dragging, uh, you know, the bodies of her children to a grave, which, and it's kind of like, it's easy to fall into that trap. And the plague is gory. You can talk about the buboes and so on. And it's kind of how you balance that engagement with, um, yeah, sort of sentiment um, or too much sort of gothic glory, if you like. But I think another challenge that is connected to that is we're talking about complexity. Um, that one of the challenges is that you kind of, it's part of our responsibility to be a bit of a bridge between the sort of academic research um, into history and the sort of public understanding. Um, but people often come to the museum with their idea of the story and with their version of history. And very often, very often, people don't actually like it when you um, challenge their view of history with a different perspective or, you know, worse still, some actual evidence <laughs> or some actual research. And it's kind of how you can do that, how you can not lose that public interest, how you can engage with it, but how you can often say, it's not as simple as that. It's more complicated. Um, and it's how you can do that without sort of people um, becoming sort of disheartened really, or things like, um, just to say, I, I, I don't know, I bet lots of people watched the Channel 5 documentaries that were on last year, the short miniseries about the plague, uh, which shared some of the research that has been done that shows that human fleas and human lice uh, and the feces of human lice and human fleas can convey the plague. And it's not just down to rat fleas. Now at the museum in Eam, the rat is our logo. We use it uh, as our logo. And I think it's really important that we're not defensive 
uh, about new research. I mean, in actual fact, as you know, Rebecca, <laughs> that research was not new. Academics have been talking about that for years. Uh, and it's part of our job as a museum to kind of when people have gone this new research. Well, it's actually not that new. People have been talking about it for years, but it's to go. Yeah, it is a bit more complicated than we thought. And to not be defensive about our story, but be to be prepared to engage with it um, and to be open to new new research, new data, new findings. And I think that we yeah, and we I think the rat will continue to be our logo, even though we'll also continue to say there is other research which shows that the rat was not entirely to blame. And, and we made a joke of it in our social media. If anyone follows us on Twitter, they'll have seen the little videos we made about our rat glove puppets, which we sell in the museum shop, displaying signs saying innocent, vindicated and so on. And I think to be able to do that, that's part of our job too. So, but that's, it is a challenge. <laughs> I think as well, it's, it kind of taps into this, to what we're seeing on a national level as well, the so-called, for want of a better phrase, culture wars, where people are, find it very difficult to accept alternative views of their own history and they become very precious over the accepted, well, their own accepted facts, in inverted commas, um, as to what happened in the past. But ONG, could you tell me a bit from um, Jenna's house, that your perspective on, on these challenges when it comes to big and established histories? I'm a big fan of nuance and I'm a big fan of complexity and I think we're in a world where binary positions and you know we're we're looking for things that can be summed up in a tweet that can be summed up in 180 characters uh, and actually most problems most uh, discussions can't be reduced to that that length and it's not helpful to do so, it's not useful. I, I'm a real believer that history is useful, that history is something that, that we really do need to study in, in all its detail. And it's just more interesting that way. Just it's it's the the story that we can tell of Edward Jenner, the story that actually the museum mostly tells in terms of, of our displays as they are at the moment. And, and the story that I think I was taught, I was told when I started the museum, and I mean, I always make this confession, I wasn't really aware of Edward Jenner when I started working at Dr. Jenner's house, and I say that, and there's always an audible gasp in the, uh, in, in the crowd, but I've been at the museum for seven years now. Um, I think when I started, I probably just knew Jenner vaccination, uh, and, and that was it. And it's, it, it is a neat story. It's, it's, it's quite an easy story to say. If you oversimplify it, you can say Edward Jenner invented vaccines, then smallpox was eradicated. Hooray for Edward Jenner. And that ignores so much of the history of vaccination. It ignores the context of this discovery. It ignores what came before. It ignores the world in which Jenner was operating and it ignores what happened later and, and ultimately ignores what happens, what's happening now. And I think um, it, it is so much more helpful and useful. I mean, to take the example of the eradication of smallpox, uh, and that's one of the, the defining events in world health history. Smallpox doesn't exist anywhere in the world outside of two laboratories. It's just such an achievement. But we've got to remember that that wasn't just because of a vaccine that was because of years of further work, Jenna's ideas being honed, Jenna's ideas being taken forward, new developments. So we were 184 years between Jenna's first vaccination and the eradication of smallpox. We needed to find ways of making that vaccine heat stable so that it could be taken to parts of the world without easy access to refrigeration. I'm saying we, like I had a part in this, I had no part to play in, in that at all, but um, the, at the time it was also necessary to find uh, you know, ways of, of actually carrying out the vaccination, the development of a bifurcated needle, this little two-pronged thing that could be reused, that could be thrown away, that was just could be just put in your back pocket and carried around without needing to have any kind of complex or, or um, expensive to carry uh, equipment. That was really, really useful. Bifurcated needle also left a significantly smaller uh, wound. 
we we talk we forget sometimes that the vaccination against smallpox involved physically scratching the vaccine into the skin it wasn't an injection so so the kind of early methods that jenna was practicing with lances involved you know cutting a gash into into your arm uh, and and that was prone to secondary infection it was something that the parents really didn't like um, and the development of the bifurcated needle was really important in, in helping people to accept vaccination against smallpox we tell uh, an institutional history of a kind of um the big power organizations of the world the cdc in the states the world health organization all these white western doctors going to parts of the world that still had smallpox but that again that's not a helpful story and it's not a, a an accurate story because actually the story that we should celebrate is the fact that it was the world working in partnerships yes there were people from the from uh, from from countries where smallpox was under control countries where smallpox had already been eliminated who did go to other parts of the world to help with their vaccination program but they did that working in tandem with people from the countries that they were in they had to rely on local health workers local health workers had the local knowledge they knew about culture they knew about the practice they were responsible for ensuring that the vaccinators were were trusted what couldn't have been achieved with just a handful of countries just saying we're going to transport ourselves in and get on with it it needed the world working together in solidarity and that's something that again is is just so important for us to remember now is that this pandemic is is a global problem it's a global problem and it requires a global solution Dr. Jenner, the whole history of vaccination is a global history. It requires us to look at it from all the different perspectives, not just saying, well, this is how it affected America. This is how it affected the UK. And, and we see today there's such a difference worldwide in how vaccines are accepted. Just across the, the channel from where we are, France has got such a different landscape on vaccine acceptancy. And, and uh, uh, really, I'm interested in, in vaccine hesitancy. It's something that we we talk about. It's something that I know a lot of people want to talk about. A lot of people want to talk about the anti-vaccination movement, um, the history of that. Um, I think we've got to go back to Edward Jenner to the start. And again, it's not just this story of Jenner carries out one vaccination, magic, everything's good. Edward Jenner had to really fight to get vaccination accepted. Edward Jenner was, he didn't go on these mass vaccination tours. I think we've got this idea of Jenner just kind of you know, walking around everywhere trying to, trying to vaccinate. Edward Jenner primarily vaccinated in his local area. As I said earlier, he set up a temple of vaccinia in his, in his garden. He vaccinated within his practice area as a country GP and he wrote to and empowered other people to vaccinate in their practice area. He was effectively establishing a network of local vaccinators uh, and that I think is, is really interesting for today, you know, th this idea that actually what people want, what people need in terms of vaccination is, is an acceptance that people do have concerns and acceptance that people will have worries and will want to ask questions and giving them the space the time and access to that trusted and reliable source of information that will help them to to have those conversations one of my favorite quotes about edward jenner is from his friend who visited him to see um to see what was um happening in the temple of vaccinia and the quote is the doctor very well understands all the fears and all of the concerns of the people who come to see him at the temple of vaccinia and and that idea of jenna just taking the time to to talk because he knew that that was what was needed and i think that's that's such an important lesson that again you don't get if you just have that simple 180 character understanding of history so i i'm very much for complexity for nuance uh, and i think that it, it just 
it's it's just so useful that you know you can see so many different um comparisons with the past but you've really got to to see it it's not just about comfortable stories it's not just about making us feel good history can challenge the present and history should challenge the present um, thank you, Owen. We just had one quick um, question pop up there asking you if you could repeat the name of the needle that you mentioned. It is a bifurcated needle. Um, ah, okay. Bifurcated needle. There you go. Um, I can't remember who it was that asked the question, but hopefully, hopefully you managed to scribble that down. Um, thank you for that, Owen. I do think for me personally, and I, I, I realise that this is this event is not about me giving my thoughts. I'm not Jerry Springer. Um, but <laughs> for me personally, I find it interesting today that, I mean, I'm a historian, so I know about medicine, I know about history, but I've always just kind of like thought, you know, you have the vaccination for something, whereas now it's a vaccination. We have multiple vaccinations for the same thing. And one of the things that I find amusing to, uh, if you don't mind me putting a lighter note on a serious topic is um, this kind of, vaccination <laughs> elitism or not elitism but like competition so you have some people like oh yes I've had the Pfizer vaccine or I've had the Oxford vaccine which is quite funny but anyway that's a, a side point well actually <laughs> if I can if I can just jump in uh, just because um the smallpox vaccine originally I mean the the rollout of of the smallpox vaccine if you can call it a rollout is 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 just fascinating in itself but there are some wonderful cartoons of the late 19th century at one point um because it was a live virus vaccine it relied on passing cowpox from either from cow to human or from person to person to person you almost used an individual as an incubator to produce the vaccine and then you could take a scratch from the, the pus and then pass it on to the next person. And there's a, a cartoon that I found last week, which um, it's a, sort of a snobbish mother. Um, the doctor says, oh, well, um, I found a, a child, your neighbor's child, Mrs. Jones's child will be able to provide the vaccine for your children. And then the mother says, oh no, doctor, we couldn't possibly have anything to do with that family. As we, you must find another person to supply us with vaccine. Uh, and so I, I think, again, you know, it's nothing new under the sun. That's good. That's great. Um, Owen R, um, you've been quiet for a while now, so I'm going to bring you in big style. Um, <laughs> so uh, what I want you to do, and um, we don't have that long actually left before we go to audience questions, but what I'd love you to do is if you could take us into e-museum and into the collection, perhaps name a couple of items and then tell me how you go about balancing the big showstopper story of Ian, which is this fight against the plague, with the local stories that you do still tell as well that aren't necessarily related to plague. How, how do you do that? Well, in, in the museum, um, our main story is the plague. And I think it will always be uh, our main story. But we do talk about other aspects of Eames history. And interestingly, our collection, um, the vast majority of our collection has nothing to do with the plague. Um, it relates to other aspects of Eames industrial heritage or it's even its earlier sort of geological, archaeological history. Oh, even we've even got um, a ring in our collection that's a medieval ring that has some association, uh, possibly fanciful, <laughs> with Richard III and an illegitimate daughter he had. And it was and, and so we, we, that's in our collection. Um, we're an, and I think we might do an online talk about that ring at some point soon, but because um, it's a really interesting story, the provenance question of that ring is, 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 is quite fascinating. Um, but we also sort of, I think it, it, with, with the collection, the actual items in the collection that relate to the plague uh, are quite few in number. We have some headstones uh, of the plague dead um we have only one of which has a name on because most of them were not named because they were very hastily just a stone with a cross gouged into it we've got two of those grave markers one with a name um we've got uh facsimiles of some of the manuscript material facsimiles of the parish registers showing the burials but so so sorry to answer your question uh we our main story is that but we do also have other aspects um, and in our this this talk tonight is part of a program um, of monthly online talks, and we're alternating between 
it's always about EAM, but one month it's plague related and the next month it's some other aspects of local history. Like last month, uh, we did one about um, the longest running strike in the footwear industry in Britain, which actually took place in EAM a hundred years ago. Um, and it was also the longest running strike, we think, where the workers were predominantly women. And, and that happened in Eam and in Stony Middleton, the next village. And we tell that story. We talk about the First World War. We talk about the prehistory. We talk about the uh, industrial, the textile heritage before the shoes and boots. Um, next month, our talk is going to be about uh, a local woman who became a teacher and writer. So we do try to do that. We did develop a hashtag, not just the plague. Uh, but the plague is the main reason people come to Eam. We're very proud of that story and it will always be our main story. But we do want in the future to do more about, uh, we, we want to make even more of the other stories, as well as the stories of what's happening in Eam now, which perhaps we can talk about that a bit later, but um, collecting the experiences of the people of Eam today and not just 100 or 300 years ago. Yeah, it must it must be really tricky. I, I mean, I, I don't I don't. Well, I do envy you, actually, because you get to be among these amazing collections day in, day out. So that's, you know, you're one of the few people in the country that can actually go into museums and have a look at these objects at the moment, which must be quite fun. Um, just um, I've got two more key questions that I want to ask you, but we are really pushed for time now. So. Owen, if I ask you the same thing as, uh, sorry, Owen G, if I ask you the same thing that I asked o Owen R, if you could just briefly answer the the challenges that you that you face in terms of balancing two stories. So in your case, you've got the historical story, but also the science story as well. Um, if you could describe that a little bit. Yeah, of, of course. And I think um, it's, it's a real challenge. I come to this from uh, an historical background. My background is in museum collections management. I confess that I'm not an immunologist. I don't know much about, uh, well, I, I, I do, I know more about immunology now than I, I did when I started, but I'm also conscious that that's not an area that is one of my strengths. Um, and yet we are a museum that wants to present something of the, the current day science of immunology. It's really important to understand how your immune system works because that helps to understand all the developments in in vaccination it helps to to set the context and i think it, i think medical literacy science literacy is so important now just to i suppose to to help us understand where we are to inspire the scientists of the future and also to to help challenge some of the the misinformation and disinformation that we see so what we do really is is we try and work with partners we we Again, it goes back to recognising what our strengths are, what our weaknesses are, and knowing when to ask for help if necessary. So we do work with other partners in the science community. A lot of our board and our trustees are come from a scientific background, so we've got that advisory role as well. Uh, but I think as well, just, just the history of science is, is perhaps... I don't know if it's, if it's underappreciated, but it's, it's something that perhaps we don't talk about as much in in a broader context we prefer to talk about the present day discoveries what i really love to hear is when people come up to me and say i came to edward jenner's house i came here as a child i stood in the temple of vaccinia and now i'm an immunologist now i'm a virologist now i work in public health and and that's just such a, a special thing so i think yeah i hopefully we've got the balance right but we know that there are we really want to develop our programs about immunology to try and roll that out into schools but we'll be working with other people who know a lot more about it than us to help us develop that. Um, thank you and I'm afraid my final question to you two um, because we do need to move on to the questions from the audience and um, um, my final question if you could give very very brief answers to what is actually a, a very important big question <laughs> um, so if you're able to do that that would be amazing so my question is um, I guess where we go from here where do where do museums go from here what practical challenges do you face from making you know making museums safe after and during covid and in terms of the stories that you tell um onr if i start with you um i'll try to be really quick uh yeah <laughs> how we reach people we're closed at the moment we can't open even if we wanted to until uh, may you know until later on in may um we're, even when we're open, 
with social distancing in place, our capacity is reduced, so we're very restricted. How do we reach people and get our story out if people can't come to visit? So obviously doing stuff like this is part of that. And it's quite exciting to think of new ways of doing things. How do we engage with schools? Schools were, uh, have always been a really huge part of what we do at AIM, school visits. How are we going to do that if they can't come or if, they're, if school trips are tailing off? So how do we get our story out there? How do we continue to engage in new ways that don't depend on people turning up at the door? Um, but I think it's quite exciting to start thinking how we could do that and how what the possibilities are, not just, but there are challenges because what resources do we need? What skills do we need? Yeah. As I said, we're a small museum, uh, but um, we've got a big story and a big audience. And, um, and so it is quite exciting to think, how could we do things differently? Um, and how can we kind of continue to people to engage with this? Oh, well, we've just had a lovely comment. Um, oh, and it's just popped off now, but saying that um, it's making one audience member and other people hungry to come and visit your museums when, when they're able to. So that's a nice thing. Owen, very, Owen G, I'm going to push you to be very, very brief here so we can get on to the, the Q&A questions. Um, the future, the, the future and everything. Tell me. <laughs> The future. Um, obviously, again, echoing echoing everything that Owen has said, um, in terms of the practicalities reopening, we are uh, facing a challenge in that we are in Edward Jenner's family home. It's it's a family home. It's got narrow corridors, nooks and crannies. It's it's um, not set up for social distancing. But we'll see. We've got a little while left to to try and plan, and we've got a plan A, B, C, D, E, but. The museum, I really hope, will be able to to open in some way, shape, or form in the summer. As for the stories, I think we've we've changed the story that we tell throughout the course of the pandemic. I think that actually this past year, you know, being in a museum, you you you're trying to do all of the research, you're trying to to keep up to date with the history, but also you're opening to the public uh, every day, and and it's a, a mad rush every time you, you you sort of you go and open up, you sit down, it's almost time to close again. Being closed for a year has given us an opportunity at Dr. Jenner's house to take a step back, to think, to read, and I've been trying very hard to engage with all of the academic research as well, which we we haven't perhaps been able to do so much. I hope that when we go back, we'll still remember that that we need to have that time and space as museum staff to to think about and to challenge our stories to make sure that we're not just repeating the same old story without ever updating it. Thank you, thank you, um, both of you. I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to the um, the Q and A questions now, and we're gonna have to do this as a kind of quick fire thing because we've had quite a few questions come through. So the first one. Um, and I'll ask ONR this one. How did your two museums get in touch with each other? Was it inspired by the pandemic events over the past year? Uh, yes, it was. I contacted I contacted the other Owen, uh, having seen some of the stuff, and I said, hey, let's have a conversation. Could we do something together? Thank you. That, there you go, Dave. You have an answer to that question. Next question is from Jane, and she says, how did the plague in Eam end, and what happened... To what happened as a result? Um, were there? Oh, sorry, I've, I've jumped a little bit here. But how did the how did the plague in Eam end, and what happened as a result? Were there consequences, as, such as an inquiry? Well, well, there, cert there certainly wasn't an inquiry. No, um, the plague ended just when the, when the deaths stopped, <laughs> um, when people stopped dying, um, they felt able. Uh, so about they waited for several weeks after the last death. And then they had a great burning, as they called it, um, of where lots of things were burnt in the village. Bear in mind, but so basically, yeah, when the death stopped, <laughs> that's when the quarantine stopped. There was no inquiry at the time. It didn't. It didn't become famous immediately. Um, there's it, the first accounts of the plague were not written of the plague in Eam, were not written for at least forty years afterwards. Um, but, and, and at the very time, it was not as famous as it later became. Um, so it's, uh, the, yeah, there was no in inquiry. Uh, quarantines continued to be, uh, in fact, one of, the, one of the accounts of what happened in Eam was written in defence of plans for a quarantine 
for an outbreak of plague that never came. Um, and the Mead, the physician that wrote this, used him as an example of why quarantining a community was a good idea. But that wasn't for another sort of 50 years until after what had happened in him. And his was only the second account. The first account was a few years before. Uh, but yeah, at the time, it wasn't as famous as it later became. And it was only really in the 18th century, in the 1700s, that it became better known. And then in the 19th century, it really took off and became a very, there'd been a few accounts. So um, I could tell you more about uh, actually what happened afterwards, but I suppose I shouldn't hog all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've, got, we've got a question about vaccination now, which I think might tap into another couple of questions that have been asked. So um, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go for this one from Christina. Um, she asks, how, how, many, how much records e exist um, for Jenna's response to the Axie va vaccine movement um, with him or its history. And did he acknowledge the, the slave? Um, I think there was an enslaved person that had taught or mentioned to um, a British, I believe, coloniser earlier on in the century about the smallpox inoculation that was being practised widely then. So was Jenna aware of that? Absolutely. And I think... It's, it's really important to say that the history of vaccination has not been one of lone scientists, people working alone, of, of the kind of the light bulb moments. Jenna was working on the back of previous work that had been carried out. The, so before vaccination, there was inoculation, which was deliberate infection with smallpox in a controlled way. This was something that had been practiced throughout Africa, throughout the Middle East, parts of Turkey, into China. And it's something that, that we really have no idea when it first started being recorded. We, we don't know who the first people to do this was. I think probably lots of people were doing it at various different points each building adapting. So there were many different types of inoculation. One of those was seen in Turkey by Lady Mary Wortley Montague, who brought it to the UK and, and popularized it here in Britain. In the United States, an enslaved man named Onesimus uh, told his slave master, the, his owner, that he was safe from smallpox. Uh, and the, this, the, the owner was Cotton Mather. Onesimus, that was the name that he had been given by his owner, had come from, we think, the west coast of Africa. He was retelling a story of how he was inoculated as a child, and that was then taken and adopted and started to be used in the United States. Uh, and actually, really, um, Onesimus, Cotton Mather didn't want to believe, he didn't want to believe what his slave had told him. Uh, and so there, there's a huge complicated history. And Jenna acknowledged that vaccination was coming off of the back of all of that, because he said vaccination is a development of, of inoculation. But crucially, I mean, the difference is that deliberate infection with smallpox, with the means of preventing smallpox, you needed to keep smallpox going um, in order to, to be safe against smallpox. And, and so what Jenna did was, was to look at how that could be adapted. And of course, Jenna was also talking about something that he had seen other people do. So we talk about Jenna being the pioneer of vaccination in as much as he turned it from, from being smallpox to prevent smallpox to being cowpox to prevent, cow, uh, to prevent smallpox, uh, but also that he managed to get it popularized and accepted uh, and I think that's that's really um, it's yeah it, it's it's such a, a complex and again that's that goes back to the complex and nuances there are so many people involved and again now with vaccine development so many people involved so many people working off of other people's discoveries uh, there was another part to that question um, did Jenner engage with anti-vaccination literature um, <laughs> again there, there's there's a, a, a long history of the anti-vaccination movement. Edward Jenner actually, um, I don't think he was that interested in engaging with um, anti-vaccination literature. Uh, he actually 
he he distanced himself from people who tried to defend vaccination through writing newspaper articles and columns poking at um, anti-vaccination um, sentiment. So I think that Jenna was a was mo lot more interested in being positive, being pro-vaccination and, and didn't really want to be debating with people who I think he realised could never be convinced otherwise. He preferred to talk to people who who just had genuine questions rather than people who were just trying to argue. Um, th thank you for that. We've got, we're probably not going to be able to get through all of the questions, I'm afraid. Um, I, I think I can really quickly answer Michael's question about the plague doctor wearing the, the beaked mask. Um, and <laughs> no, there isn't any evidence of that existing in England at the time, but there are, there are, um, um, there is a beaked mask in a museum in Germany somewhere. Um, but obviously this conversation can carry on on Twitter afterwards. If you use that ha hashtag and find the museums, you can ask questions again there. I'll just go through two more questions. Um, Owen R, I will bring you in um, now. And then, um, I, yeah, I will bring you in now. But after that, um, Owen G, I've got a question from Keith Chapin's son. And um, he wanted to ask about how big Edward Jenner's needle was. Um, but also a follow-up question as to, to what extent did the real or imagined pain of the process of vac vaccination fuel doubts about the value um, of the vaccination? So if you just keep that question in mind, and I'll go to um, ONR first to ask you about what, whether you might be, um, well, firstly, a question from Rebecca, um, were there any satirical pamphlets or woodcuts from the time about plague, but then also how much the pandemic, this is a question from Erin, the pandemic of COVID-19 will play into future stories, if at all, within your museum's collection? Oh, right. Well, um, pamphlets, satirical pamphlets, there aren't any about Eam, but there are others about plague. Um, there's some quite famous one of a skeleton over London, uh, which I think you'll have seen and is used a lot on covers of books. Um, uh, it's quite a popular one. But the, the writing about Eam, like I say, didn't actually start until several years afterwards. Uh, uh, so, but there are other pamphlets and woodcuts and things about plague from in other places. There's lots, there's actually a lot of material on that. Um, the other question, um, it was about how the story of COVID is going to enter our museum story, wasn't it? Um, yeah. Well, very much entirely. Um, we really want to capture the experience of um, COVID and EAM today because, you know, our collection hasn't stopped. We continue to record the stories of EAM and the life of that community. And in particular, this experience that EAM has had, uh, as has the rest of the world, um, we really want to capture that. And um, we're, we're already thinking about ways we might do that um, and collecting material from the village uh, from people's experiences because it's really important to capture the perspectives uh, and to capture a range of voices and perspectives of what's going on because otherwise we'll only have one version and that's often what happens uh, even in Eam. We have uh, we have a few letters uh, from Mumpesson, the rector of the parish that, that have survived but we don't have any letters from anybody else in the village. Um, so, you know, there's actually, we can't, it's really important that we capture a range of voices and a range of perspectives of what's happening now so that in the future, um, we can really, you know, people can understand the breadth of experience um, that, we're, that we've all had and we've all had our own experiences yeah. as well as the shared experience. Of Absolutely, it's been such a learning curve just living through it. And um, Owen G, could you answer the question from um, the, the, the son <laughs> who's watching this as well? Of course. Mm -hmm. How big was Jenna's needle? Um, well, Jenna didn't really use um, needles in the sense of, of hypodermic syringes as we, we might imagine them now. He used a range of different things, but most likely he was using a lancet, which is a, a small surgical knife. It's probably about that big uh, with a, a blade on it to, to actually cut into, into people's skin. Um, he would also use the uh, use ivory points as well which were similar shapes you could dry the cowpox material onto those so you could then send them to to other people um send send us an email get in touch with um with dr jenna's house through our website we'll send you a picture of of a lancet and um 
yeah, it, I mean, I, I'd probably I'd take a, a hypodermic syringe over a, a lancet any day, I'll be honest. And there was a second part of the question, which was... Um, which was, let me pull that question up now. It's about fear then... of, the, of it hurting. Yes, um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Ab yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's really important to say that, that the early process of vaccination, which relied on, on taking material from one person and, you know, infectious material from one person and scratching it into another person, was not a sterile procedure. And so the wounds were prone to, to secondary infection, of course, but also it was transmitting other infections. So it was, it was painful, yes, the wound could become infected. I mean, you were deliberately infecting someone with, with cowpox, but a, a lot of the early concerns, the, I suppose the, the, the challenge with, with, with getting smallpox vaccination accepted to begin with was that a lot of the anti-vaccination rumors had a small grain of truth in you know people were saying well vaccination just gives you other diseases uh, it's not because of vaccination giving you other diseases but that process whilst it was still not sterile could of course cause another infection huge advances have been made since in terms of, of how we do that and yet still for some reason we see these these same old anti-vaccination uh tropes being put out on on social media and the like of vaccination will just give you another disease that's the same argument they were using in in the 1850s and uh, that does have some truth but Antoine vaccination was eventually banned uh, and again going forwards there have been so many different advances to to go from that original proposal that Jenna made all the way back in 1796. Um, while you were speaking, we had a, a, a chat pop up from um, a lady called Bridget who says she's from the older generation. I'm sure you're not that old, but she um, says that she's had she had the smallpox vaccination and it didn't hurt. So there we go. Vaccinations don't hurt. Wonderful. <laughs> um, so here's hoping that Keith's son is perhaps one of these future immunologists that pop into Dr. Jenner's house and tells you that he, you know he was inspired by by this talk to do it but good luck whatever you do Keith's son and um, that brings us to the end of our talk Owen R and Owen G thank you ever so much for being so brilliant today and um, if you want to as I said continue the conversation afterwards please use the hashtag eam Jenna now um, and I just want to flag a couple of things before I leave you to the rest of your evening First one is um, Eam has a talk that's coming up on the 22nd of March to tie in with Women's History Month. And it's a talk on Doris Coates, who is an Eam teacher and writer. And then at Jenna's house, um, there is a talk about vaccine hesitancy, which is coming up on Friday, the 5th of March, which is next week. Um, so check out the website um, to um, book, book and sign up for those talks. Lastly, please, you know, Think, consider donating to the museums it's a tough time for everyone I'm sure but if you can and um, it would be very much appreciated but in, until next time thank you to the amazing speakers and thank you to you the audience for being brilliant and posing some really wonderful questions thank you <laughs>